I was a deportation officer on uh, September 11th, and actually I was in New York City um, when the Twin Towers were struck. Anthony and I met working in the uh, institutional hearing program. I was a trial attorney, so I was the person who was taking a lot of the cases that he was arresting people for and putting them in front of the immigration judge. Welcome to No Border, No Country. Today, we have a very special guest who we'll be talking with. Uh, it's Anthony Zito. Anthony's a good friend of mine from way back. We worked together at the Institutional Hearing Program at U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Anthony was a deport officer. I was a trial attorney at the time. Uh, Anthony started uh, as an immigration inspector. Uh, he worked in New York and then in California, as well as in the pre-flight inspection uh, in Dublin. And then he moved over to become a deport officer. So, Anthony, welcome to the No Border, No Country podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for having me. So uh, we brought Anthony on to talk about the realities of immigration enforcement. You hear a lot of things on the news uh, about immigration enforcement, how it gets done, and uh, and and what it looks like. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of needing a deportation force. Well, Anthony was part of that deportation force that exists already, and uh, he uh, was on the street actually uh, arresting illegal alien fugitives. We got to say the A word in this circumstance. Uh, so anyways, Anthony, maybe to start out, you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got started in immigration and uh, and how your career went. Sure. And, I, and I'm going to clarify the one thing that you said, illegal alien fugitives. They were almost always or actually always criminal aliens. OK. So not just illegal aliens. They were criminals. Well. That, that's an important point. You know, we. We have to weed through everything, and, and there's no way that we can just grab everyone. We never did raids where we just swept people off the street. We were always targeting specific subjects, and they were always criminal. So just to, just to clarify that, but uh, I'll go back to myself then. Well, in, in uh, 1991, I was uh, graduating from college, and uh, we had a uh, government recruiter come to our school and talk about uh, jobs with the government. And they they uh, they explained to us you got to go take a test uh, to to get a job for a number of different agencies. And I said, hey, what the heck? I need to start working. So um, at the time, business marketing wasn't uh, wasn't going to do it. <laughs> um, so uh, I took the test, and I guess I did well. And and at that time, I was hired as an immigration inspector. Um, I had never traveled internationally, didn't know anything about immigration. Um, and I was like, oh, OK, you know, it's down at JFK, you know, relatively close to where I live. And so I took the job and um, uh, it was a pretty good experience, um, you know, working at JFK. Uh, I got to see everything under the sun coming in. And uh, and I was the uh, welcome wagon for immigrants, non-immigrants and, and asylees, et cetera, that were coming in uh, through our uh, airport. Um, went to the academy a year later and uh, had an opportunity, saw an opening out in California and said, what the heck, let me put in for it. Uh, I'm young, not married, single. Let, let me try something else out. And uh, went out to San Francisco, uh, worked at the uh, airport there as well, doing the, the same function as an inspector, which is now the equivalent of a uh, customs and border protection officer. And basically, you at the time, because we were INS, we only inspected people. Um, we didn't do the baggage. We did the the applicants for admission. Was there for a couple of years and and wasn't crazy about California to begin with. In San Francisco it was uh, not not that not that I not that New York is any better, but I went from bad to worse and saw an opening for deportation officer and and, and saw that it was pretty close to, to my my home and said, oh let me uh, let me apply for this. Got selected. And uh, the position itself was a newly created, uh, I guess, a, another IPO or, or, or what have you, IPA, they call them. It's, it's a, a, a position. It was specifically for the IRP or the IHP, which was the, at the time the Institutional Hearing Program. So um, what I had heard back then was that seven of the states that were most impacted by criminal aliens incarcerated in their prisons sued the feds and said, hey, feds, you guys are responsible for letting all these aliens into the country. Uh, we have them locked up in our prisons and we need to do something about it. 
And the government's response at the time was, we'll create these IRPs, these institutional removal programs, or these IHPs, where we'll put immigration judges inside the prisons. Uh, we'll have them uh, have the subjects placed in removal proceedings or deportation proceedings at the time. And um, we can get the process going so that um, either you can parole them and let them get deported before their sentence is up, or once their sentence is done, it, it, it saves the government money as well because we don't have to detain them any longer through proceedings and we can deport them immediately. So that program worked really well in New York State. We were actually stationed within uh, a maximum security prison, downstate uh, correctional facility, which has since closed because of the uh, political atmosphere in New York. But um, <laughs> that, That's how Anthony and I met in prison. <laughs> And, and spent time in prison together. Insert joke here. <laughs> face to face, we met them. Yes. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the program worked pretty well. And we would actually, you know, grab subjects as they were paroled from state custody and um, bring them into our detention. Some of them were already com completed with their removal proceedings. So we could ship them out relatively quickly. Others that had started the proceedings but at least the you know uh the process was was already there and and so we could complete it while they're in our custody and new york state benefited as well because they created a a parole specifically for um immigration uh, criminal aliens which was called a conditional parole for deportation only if they had been convicted of a non-violent felony and, and i i don't know the specific um requirements and they also had been ordered removed already. They uh, they could go in front of the parole board and request this conditional parole for deportation only. And they would tell immigration at the time. Immigration would then uh, take custody of these subjects and, and deport them. So they were getting time shaved off their sentence because they were criminal aliens and their country was willing to take them back. If they came back, they and they were caught, of course, they would have to go back to the state and, and owe them time. Yeah, if I recall correctly, in order to qualify for the program, they had to have completed two thirds of their mandatory minimum, not have any uh, administrative segregation punishment, and uh, it had to be a, a non felony crime and non violent crime. Yeah, yeah. And, and that non violent was kind of fuzzy at times because some of these yeah. guys. And actually, in the beginning, when I when when they first started doing it, um, we had um, we had the big three that we used to deport. And it was almost always for drugs back in the nineties. It was the um, the Colombians, the Jamaicans, and the Dominicans nationals from those three countries. And uh, I specifically recall one Colombian cartel guy doing twenty five to life for for a big amount of cocaine and. One of our bosses reviewed his case and said, this guy shouldn't be deported. He's going to go back to Columbia and just start the whole, you know, business back up. So he chose not to get him paroled or released to immigration to be deported. And the guy ended up suing and we ended up taking him and deporting him anyway. And he said, hey, I, I qualify for this, you know, for this parole and you guys are not letting me go. So it was an interesting program, which makes me think that why were the states able to sue the feds back then? And why don't they sue them now for the mess that we have? You have a question, it's the same situation. It's, it's you know, you, hey, feds, look, look what you've done to us. And now you're not even giving us money to to, to cover the costs of, the, of these, you know, these illegals. So what, what's going on? So it's just, yeah, it's a sign of the times. But I think if you look to your past, you, you, you can almost always correct the problems of the, of the present. Anthony, we've seen a lot of stories the last few years about uh, what's going on within ICE, that uh, th they've had a lot of uh, politically correct language they're mandated to use now, and they're they're subtly changing the mission of the organization from within. What's your experience? What have you heard about that? I is the organization having retention issues from the people who signed up for the original mission, or I is it being hollowed out from within, or what's what's the status inside ICE as you understand it? Well, I mean, I've been gone now for almost two years. I I, uh, I retired for a number of reasons. I, I would have preferred to, to work until my mandatory retirement age, which would have been 57. I mean, it would have been coming around next year. But uh, the, the main reason I left was because they were um, ordering 
deportation officers to go down to the southern border and, and help pretty much be a crossing guard and process these aliens that are coming in that, that, that you know, that they're letting in. And I have responsibilities at home. That's not what I signed up for when I, when I started uh, as a deportation officer 30 years ago. My job was to remove aliens, not to let them in. And, uh, and so I didn't want to go. And I said, you know what, I'll put my paperwork in. But uh, you have a bunch of great guys in the deportation officer position. Guys that want to do their job. That's why they signed up. And, um, and for many, many years, we didn't do our job. Um, when I came on board, um, and we were here, like I explained, we were only handling the state cases. The state prisons were surprised when we show up to pick up, you know, subjects. They'd be like, oh, you guys showed up today. You never used to show, show up. So it started flat, getting better and better. And we were, we were building up our, our, I guess, our credibility by, by actually performing uh, our job. And, uh, and we were, you know, I guess during the last administration, we would plateau because everyone was working really, really hard, actually harder than we wanted to. Um, it just didn't stop because as you know, we're inundated. And if we, if we want to, we can turn around, sneeze and, 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 and find work. So guys were getting burnt out in that sense from what I experienced. They would just, it's like, it's just too much. It's, it's just too much work. And uh, one of the functions that I was doing was, was, was uh, the secure communities, which was uh, getting uh, real time hits of subjects that were arrested on the street. And then we'd run out and, and try to, you know, grab them as they were released from, from local precincts and police departments and courts. And we, we just couldn't handle it. We just could not handle it. And I think guys, like I said, were getting really burnt out. I, I you know, I was at the, uh, you know, I was on the ground um, working. I never dealt with the administration. DC, it was never detailed to see, you know, the atmosphere there. So I really don't know if it's swung or, and I can surmise that it has, um, but I, I really didn't experience that much of the, uh, the change, um, as you're saying. Yeah, I was an immigration judge when everything changed. And it was, uh, I think the prior administration was laying, uh, you know, laying down foundations to expand the number of officers, the number of judges, and kind of continue doing what it had you guys doing, but make it, you know, easier and safer for everyone to do by having enough people. And th that definitely changed. I mean, we had pressure put on us as immigration judges to find a reason to to grant every benefit and to to not order people removed. I was never able to substantiate whether a uh, a single person that I had actually ordered deported was actually removed, and uh, you know, which was shocking because I heard the hundreds upon hundreds of cases. So it's uh, it's there's definitely some up and down. Now you mentioned something that I want to bring up, which was arrests at courts, which have become extremely controversial. I don't understand why, having spent most of my adult working life in and out of courts, it's a very common thing for people to be arrested in courts. Why? Because that's where legal business gets done. So, so can you tell our audience some of your experience with how ICE was handling court arrests and, and other similar sensitive arrests when you were working? Well, in New York, um, it seemed as if the state was was even though we were working with the state prisons and we had a relationship with them in regards to the, the most worst criminals you know on the face of the earth they um they kept that hush hush and out in the in the public view they did anything they could to stop us from doing our job i believe the current uh, new york state attorney general um first sent out notification to local sheriffs that if ICE had a detainer on a subject and the guy was getting released, either he went to court that day and he was getting ROR or he was getting, um, you know, he had finished his time or he was getting cut loose. ICE had to be there immediately to assume custody and they couldn't hold the subject for a day, an hour, a minute, longer than because the judge had ordered them removed. And so, we didn't have the time to grab grab these subjects because she scared the living bejesus out of the out of the sheriffs from holding um, subjects for us. So, you know, something that we've been doing for years and years, we we would say, hey, you know, this guy just got released from the judge. 
we'll hold them overnight and you guys come grab them in the morning. And that, that was great. And we did that all the time. Then all of a sudden something changed and we, they couldn't do it anymore. Then it got to the point where they weren't allowed to even communicate with us and tell us that there was a criminal alien incarcerated in their facility. So we had to do our own research and go on their, on their websites and run rap sheets and make phone calls and, hey, is this guy with you? And then sometimes we'd get a straight answer, other times we wouldn't. The icing on the cake was about four years ago, um, New York State created a, a law called Protect Our Courts, which is, is said that currently the assembly has a bill, a bill trying to repeal this law, but um, I don't think it's going to pass. Uh, the Protect Our Courts law was that it forbid immigration officials from making arrests in New York state courts on an administrative warrant. So it covered the courts, their parking lots, and even forbid immigration officers from making an arrest on the day the subject was supposed to go to court. So I guess once the, once the law was enacted, our supervisors and management went to the, uh, went to the attorneys and said, look into this, can they do this? And I, I think the attorneys kind of said, well, uh, they really, they can do it. Do we have to comply? Uh, I guess we should. So now what's happening is an easy arrest where we could grab a couple guys, you know, in a matter of, of, of hours takes days because you're going to have to make the arrest at his home. You're going to have to knock on doors. You're going to have to go into neighborhoods. You're going to have to, you know, go in with guns, guns ablaze. And you're doing what you're trying to avoid. You're trying, you, you don't want to scare the communities. You don't want to scare the regular folk. You just want to go in and grab the subject you're looking for. And you can't do that anymore. It takes time. It takes surveillance. It takes figuring out when he leaves the house. And, and you know, and we can only do, um, you know, knock and talks or, or uh, administrative arrests at homes between the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. So it just really makes our job that much harder. And I, I, I hope, you know, in addition to the uh, no bail law in, in New York State, this is another, another law that needs to, you know, be repealed. Things have gotten so bad the last couple of years. Um, a lot of people are saying now that the, one of the remedies that's going to be needed to fix it is, is a deportation program on a massive scale, unlike anything we've ever seen before. Based on your experience, is something like that feasible? I mean, how would that look if we were to implement such a thing and what would it require? Um, because due process of removal proceedings, as Matt knows very, very well, can be lengthy. We're going to need more jail space. That's the first thing, because right now we're just a hodgepodge of detention. Um, we rent space from local jails, then they get upset with us and they kick us out. And then we find another place and then we're driving from New York. Gosh, we used to go all the way down to Salisbury, Maryland to detain cases because we had no space in the New York area. I think that's one of the one of the main concerns. Number one is is getting more jail space for immigration cases. And you're going to need thousands upon thousands of, of, of beds. Uh, the other thing is, of course, hiring more immigration judges. I, I think we figured out ways to do things more efficiently. Um, immigration, ICE itself, we were doing a lot more charter flights to remove subjects, whereas in the past, you know, we would just put guys on the plane and send them back to their native countries. Now we're chartering an entire plane and sending back a plane full. So that's, that's making things more efficient, more effective. But there's a lot of infrastructure that I believe needs to be done before we can actually affect this huge immigration force. Yeah. What about the people doing what you did, the, the actual removal part on the ground? How many more people do you think you'd need? Is it possible to, to get that kind of quantity of people deported or rounded up um, at least? Yeah, yeah, actually... Even, um, you know, we used to, um, we, we had a unit called the, um, the, the JPATS unit, the Justice Repatriation Unit. I think they were out of Arizona. And um, they even hired um, retired officers, retired law enforcement uh, annuants. And those guys, you know, enjoyed doing that work. So, you know, you don't have to hire full-time employees. You can hire, you know, part-time employers or annuants as well. But you're going to need, you're going to need more guys, you know, in order to go arrest the guy. You have to then come back and you have to process and you have to, you know, request travel documents. There's so much involved in, in process. 
that you do need manpower. You do need. Now, you mentioned J-PADS. Uh, this is something I think that the audience will find interesting. So that was just this prisoner and alien transport system. And uh, if anyone's ever seen that uh, horrid movie with Nicolas Cage called Con Air, j Pats was Con Air. That was a real thing. So the Justice Department had its own uh, airlines. They owned a whole bunch of huge Boeing and McDonnell Douglas airplanes that they used to uh, transport federal prisoners, but also on a contract basis, state prisoners uh, between various correctional facilities. And one of the major ways that that program made money was it had a contract with INS and then later with ICE to uh, take people overseas. And so they would do like a, what was it, Anthony? Like a, a once a month flight to the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Sure. They, they were getting more frequently, but uh, frequent. Um, and then they would even have um, scheduled, you know, um, uh, flights to certain countries. So once they got enough, um, you know, uh, bookings for to fill up a plane, <laughs> they would go to India. They would go to. So I, um, I had never done it before, but they they were coming up uh, a little more frequently um, towards the end of my my career. So I volunteered to do uh, a flight to Vietnam. <laughs> well, it wasn't Vietnam; it was India. Mm -hmm. So at the time they had, uh, I guess they had gathered enough subjects, mostly non-criminal that had come across the border. They were in detention for quite some time and they, they were able to fill up a plane uh, of Indian nationals. So um, I said, let me try this out for once. Let me see what it's all about. So uh, we flew from Dallas to, I don't know, we made about four or five different stopovers, <laughs> filled up the plane Finally made it to India, let them let them off, and then we ended up flying to Vietnam and overnighting in Vietnam. But um, it was basically a con air, and they had immigration deportation officers. And they'd given a special training on on what to do, of course, if these guys rioted or or, or uh, you know or or were being uh, unruly. And uh, basically, it was a, a plane full of uh, you know. If you look from the back, you saw a lot of lot of uh, you know. Uh, headdresses uh, of the Indians. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was pretty interesting. It was a, it was a good deal. And they, and those flights were happening more and more frequently. So, uh, so they were, they were really figuring it out in that sense. Now, justice eventually withdrew from that though, I think, because of a right. lot of the controversy. I think, yeah. I think these were ours. Now we were doing all the work ourselves because there was some, uh, some headquarter folk on, on the plane as well. They were, they were in charge of coordinating. Yeah, Justice, I think, pulled out of it, and then they the ICE uh, leased all of the planes uh, from some type of a, an aviation company, and then it became ICE Air as opposed Air. to Con Air. Anthony's yeah. much better looking than Nick Cage anyway, so. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's interesting for, for the people that watch this podcast to, to understand the amount of effort and manpower that goes into this because it helps them understand – how vast the problem that's currently being created is. So how, how long was the academy when you went? Um, I went to regular immigration officers, basic training course. And at the time, there was a number of positions that immigration officer positions that were required to complete the IOBTC. Um, and inspectors uh, was included in that. Deportation officers. Immigration examiners, who are now CIS officers. Yep, I was an immigration examiner. And we were all immigration officers. We all had the same authority. We all worked for the same agency. And they could, because we all, uh, you know, uh, qualified with firearms, we all passed PT and what have you, they could interchange us. So back in the INS days, they had no problem detailing you to do a function in USCIS or, or having adjudicators go to the airport and help out. And so I, I had the opportunity even to, um, when I was in California, to uh, work with um, adjudications, exams at the time, as you're aware of, during Citizenship USA back in the 90s when, uh, when the president at the time wanted to uh, naturalize everyone and their mother. So I, I did a 30-day uh, detail to, from the airport to the downtown office in, uh, in San Fran. And uh, basically, you know, they gave us a, a day of training and said, okay, go in and interview these uh, applicants, um, you know, go through their application, you know, check mark that everything is correct. 
give them their little, uh, you know, uh, three questions and then uh, have them write a, you know, a sentence in English. And I recall at the time that, you know, some of the applicants were not eligible. They, they couldn't pass if you, you know, if, if you put it right in front of them. And I, I remember specifically supervisors coming into my cubicle and saying, no, 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 let's give them a second chance. Let's give them another try. And I, I was ready to continue it and say, hey, you got to come back. And, you know, and, and of course, being a young guy, not knowing any better back then, I wasn't going to question anything or, 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 you know, start bucking the system. So, of course, I, I, I complied. But they were they were naturalizing, you know, more than you can handle, only to find out years later when I was a deportation officer that, they shouldn't have been naturalizing probably half of them. They had they had rap sheets. They had criminal records. They didn't you know they didn't really uh, uh, clear these people to become U.S. citizens. And you guys know how hard it is to denaturalize naturalize a subject. We were talking about the need to add more people in to do what you did, and tell us a little bit about what's what's the training process like for that, and what, what kind of lag time does that create from the time you. You can hire a new agent to the time they can actually get in the field. Um, I can speak from the experience of 30 years ago when I was hired. Of course, they had to do a background check, an intensive background check. You know, people, you know, investigators are coming to your home, to your neighbor's homes. They're verifying all the information um, of, of your past. And and and, uh, and then when they finally do have space, you know, you, I started working before I went to the academy, but then you know, eventually you'll be sent to the academy. The academy is six months long. It's it's pretty intensive. You're learning immigration law. You're learning, uh, you know, physical techniques. You're learning how to shoot a gun. I had never shot a gun before. Um, so they they basically taught me from scratch. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, intensive Spanish. Um, they test you initially. If you could pass and speak Spanish uh, sufficiently, you, you don't have to do the extra month. I didn't, so I had to stay the extra month. Then you get back to your office and there's post-academy training, there's on-the-job training. You, you need time to figure out what you're doing. And uh, and of course, you start working with a journey level officer. But, you know, this is like a minimum of, I believe, like a two-year process from the time that, you know, say Congress gives uh, the agency the authority to hire an additional thousand, thousand officers. It's going to be at least two years before they can actually have officers on the ground doing the job, uh, as far as I see it. And I don't even know it in this day and age if, number one, people want to work for ICE. Number two, if they're qualified to work for ICE. Number three, if they can pat, pass the background investigation. If they want to, you know, make the measly government salary. So there's a lot of different circumstances involved. Um, um, so, you know... This thing about, you know, oh, we're going to get, you know, an immigration force to get out there and start. It's easier said than done. So, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about this. I, I started as an immigration examiner uh, in Citizenship USA. And that was at the time where they were eliminating that program where everybody was interchangeable in the immigration officer category. Um, so they were revamping the training. I never got the the police training, and they sent somebody from the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center to give us the immigration law training. I didn't wind up going to Fletzy until I was a trial attorney with ICE, and and they sent us there for uh, for two weeks for you know even the trial attorneys. It wasn't law enforcement training, but Fletzy has a mock courtroom, and they had us do mock hearings until we were were familiar with it, so we could uh, you know more easily go in and do things. But so this is the thing I wanted you to comment on. The Department of Homeland Security theoretically was combining immigration and customs enforcement and making everything more enforcement oriented. But at the same time, they got rid of that model where everybody at immigration could do the enforcement job. And, and I don't know how you felt, but I, I was very proud to do the job and I felt like I was serving the country. But I always felt like the case wasn't over until the alien won and that everything was pitched toward preserving benefits for the alien, worrying about due process for the alien. But other than us, there wasn't anybody worrying about the American people. So what's, what's your take on all of that? I don't know. I, I think that what you virtually did, and, and this is maybe totally different from what you're, you're asking me is that instead of creating, um, 
one, you know, one streamlined channel. You, you created multiple agencies with multiple management structures. And basically you gave raises to a lot of people when you didn't have to, because <laughs> you have more management, of course, because you have, you know, and, and I was also very active in our local union for 15 years. I was the uh, executive vice president of local 1917, um, AFGE, American Federation of Government Employees. And when the agency split up, um, initially we were fighting a one-headed monster. Then it turned into a three-headed monster because we had three different management structures. So, and, and they didn't always work well with one another in the sandbox. And, and I thought it was pretty stupid because I took the oath just like an examiner took the oath, just like a deportation officer and a special agent. And we all were here to enforce the INA. And so we should have been interchangeable and we should be able to, if God forbid something happens in a, in a time of, of need, uh, when our country needs us, we sh they should be able to deploy us to different facets to, to, to help out. And they pretty much did away with that once they, once everybody, you know, got comfy in their own position, in their own agency. Yeah, back in the old days, the attorneys actually even were still considered immigration officers. Right, right. And, ISOs. And, yep, and had had authority to arrest and, uh, and all of those kind of things, but not so much anymore. I can only imagine some of the situations you must have found yourself in working in removals, but... Was there one experience during your time that, that really stuck with you that, that's hard to forget? I was, I was a deportation officer on uh, September 11th, and actually I was in um, New York City um, when the Twin Towers were struck. Uh, I, was, I was walking into Federal Plaza uh, to, to do my union duties, where we had the office down, down there at the Federal Building right downtown Manhattan, literally blocks from, from the World Trade Center. And uh, I was actually walking into the building and saw one of the towers smoking. And people were like, oh, a plane hit the hit the tower. And I'm like, I couldn't see from the angle I was I was walking that there was actually a plane, but I saw some smoke and I'm like, oh, it was probably a little prop plane or something that, that hit the tower. Didn't think much of it, continued walking. As I was about to walk into the building, I heard an explosion. Looked, around, looked to my back and I saw the ball of fire and it was the second tower getting hit. And at that time, then people were flocking out of the building and you know, Everybody was, was trying to get the hell out of lower Manhattan. The next day I went to work and, you know, they had kind of figured out who had done this already. I think by the second or third day, they, they knew that it was foreign terrorists. They knew that they were here on, on, uh, on, on, on student visas, learning, going to flight schools. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, the INS at the time should have been keeping tabs on these guys. So are we going to go out there and start rounding up every, uh, Flight, you know, every Middle Easterner from a, you know, in a flight school. What are we doing? Are we going to start, you know, doing investigations? Are we going to start, you know, grabbing bad guys? And I was told by my supervisor, just sit right down. We're not doing anything right now. And I was like, really? We're at war now. Our, our lives have been changed forever. And we're going to sit back and do nothing? It was just really mind-boggling and, and, and very sad at the same time. What does that mean to you in terms of U.S. immigration policy at that time and now and, and the terror threats we face? We hear about these people on terror watch lists coming through. How does that how does that play to you? So we know who comes in if they come in, in a non -immigrant, with a non-immigrant visa. We know these guys overstay. We know that, you know, who's supposed to be here and who's not, at least from a non-immigrant standpoint. And uh, and. We're not going out and grabbing those guys that overstay their visas, and who knows what the hell is happening at the border and who's coming in. So, so it's 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 actually you know, and they said, oh, we 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 figured things out. Our intelligence is better nowadays, and and you know, so we what happened back in you know in two thousand one isn't going to happen again. That's bullshit. They're they're, they're appeasing us. They they're trying to keep the public uh, you know blind and dumb. And uh, I, I personally think that. We're in worse shape, and especially with with that forest border. So, uh, you know, we're doomed. Now, you said something before we went on camera that I think the audience should hear. You said the September 11, 2001 attacks were an immigration thing, nothing else. And I agree with you. It got classified as a failure of imagination and a failure of intelligence, I think the 9-11 Commission said. 
But I, I think to anybody who worked in immigration, we were all looking at it going, no, it was a failure of immigration policy and immigration enforcement. What do you think about that? I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. That's that's what I said. And everybody's like, no, it's the FBI. They should have been keeping tabs. And no, it's this one and it's that one. And everybody's pointing fingers. We did it. We let those guys in. We weren't keeping tabs on them. Mia culpa, man. Yeah, it, well, it was the second time because that all started with the blind shake. People forget there were two attacks on the World Trade Center. And uh, right about the time you would have been starting doing this, uh, do you remember when they had that that cell that the, uh, the NYPD found that was building bombs to do an attack on the subway? I, I vaguely remember that. I, I, I don't remember specific. And I don't think immigration ever responded directly to that either. I think eventually the guys wound up getting deported, but... To me, immigration ought to be the first line response to stuff like that. Well, here in New York, you always hear about how the NYPD has these special terrorist units. They have cops that go overseas and are posted in overseas countries. And I'm like, isn't that the Fed's job? Why, why does the NYPD have to do this type of work? It, it, it doesn't, it, it's just strange. And then are they cooperating with one another? Are they sharing information? If they were, the feds already have people overseas. Why do we have to have the local cops have people overseas as well? It just, you know, if you think about that and it's like, yeah, maybe maybe we aren't really as better off now than we were back then. Ever since Greg Abbott started busing migrants to New York and, and other cities, there's been a lot of questions being asked, a lot of focus on sanctuary cities and, and the policies they employ. And now that since uh, Lake and Riley was killed in Georgia, it, it's intensified even more. What do you think of some of these arguments that these mayors and advocates make for sanctuary policies? Like, for example, they'll say, well, it actually makes communities safer because these uh, people who are here illegally will be more likely to cooperate with police. And it's, it's just better all around. It's They don't live in fear of, of the police. I mean, what, what do you make of some of these arguments that these people make in favor of sanctuary policies? At this point, with the number of illegal aliens that are in this country, I don't think it makes a damn difference because... They're all scared of the police. They, they probably got beat down by the police in their own country anyway. So whether the police is immigration, NYPD, Secret Service, or, you know, or the meter maid, um, I, I don't think they're going to cooperate as well as they should. So, you know, sanctuary, New York was already a sanctuary city when I came on board as an inspector 30, you know, 30 some odd years ago. And I didn't really understand what that was because I was an inspector and I didn't live in New York City. But once I became a deport officer, I, I figured it out that, you know, the um, the DOs in New York, you know, never work with the local police department in, in New York City. We had a better relationship in the Hudson Valley in the northern counties, and they actually loved us until they didn't love us, which was probably, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And then they stopped talking to us. And I, I was like, really? I'm hoping that things flip in New York. The New York City mayor has already mentioned that he would like to talk to immigration, talk to ICE about getting rid of the sanctuary policy. I think that's his answer to, we need to do something because I'm drowning. And he's actually thinking about it. Whether it's going to happen or not is another story. I mean, ICE was kicked out of Rikers Island because of their sanctuary policies. ICE was kicked out of Nassau County Jail because of their sanctuary policies. So we've been pretty much forced out of all, you know, all the local jails um, and, you know, have received no cooperation. So um, I I'm just hoping everything flips back the other way, but it's got to get probably even worse before it does. All right. So um, parting shot, what do you think Americans need to know about our immigration system and how it works? You know, as a guy who knows this, and you're watching the news, what do you think you know that the public doesn't and they should know? The laws are already there. Would I like to see some changes to the law to make it a little easier? Um, but everything is already in place for us to do our job. Just get someone in office that gives immigration the blessing to do their job. And and, and we're going to take care of business. Um it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not our fault, and uh, we want to do our job. And and deportation officers have a, a a rough job to do, 
and uh, they just want to come to work and, 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 and get satisfaction and not sit on their hands and be told, no, you just sit there. You can't do anything right now because of the powers that be. So all of this stuff about the immigration system being broken and there needing to be new powers is all smoke and mirrors. The laws exist now to do what we need to do. Absolutely. Awesome. Anything else you want to cover before we wrap up? No, I mean, um, there was, I mean, we talked about, I did the, uh, the charter flight because it was like one of my uh, things to do before I retired. There was also um, during the last uh, administration, they started doing a couple mega raids. I was involved in one raid on a chicken, uh, a couple chicken facilities down in Mississippi. Huge scale raid, uh, you know, employment, um, uh, employer sanctions or work site enforcement, however you want to call it. You know, we went into these uh, chicken plants and we pretty much, you know, shut them down and, and vetted and, and, and when they were hiring a lot of illegal aliens. I don't know who pissed off this company or, or the owner of this company and why they were raided and not others. I don't unfortunately know, like you don't know how many guys you ordered removed were actually removed. I don't know how, whether these companies were cited, whether they were criminally uh, charged, whether they paid any fines. But again, the laws are on the books for us to do work site enforcement. And that was the only experience I ever had with work site enforcement. But you know, when you ha when, when when you start a new job, you have to fill out an I nine. Is there anyone out there that's going into businesses and checking I nines? I, I don't know. So your career was how long? About thirty years. A uh, total of thirty one years, twenty eight years as a deportation officer, and one experience of worksite enforcement. Exactly, because it was a voluntary thing that you know I got to go down to the. Uh, to the bayou and and, uh, and and experience something different. Yeah, absolutely. One of the remedies we're hearing from these uh, politicians who are, I guess you would consider them anti-borders, is that they're saying, we got to get some of these people here legally to work. We got to be able to allow them to work. But isn't, isn't a big part of the deportation process uh, cracking down on employers who hire people who are here illegally? Absolutely. Um, and our... Criminal investigation and Homeland Security investigations, they, companies um, that have a, it's their practice to hire illegal aliens. You know, yeah, you can go into the mom and pop deli and, and restaurant and you're going to find, uh, you know, illegal aliens working, uh, dishwashing, cleaning, cooking, whatever. But then you have these large scale um, corporations that are, that are hiring illegal aliens um, to work for them as well. I don't think that giving illegal aliens work permission is going to solve the problem. I think we'll get more money and they, they, can, they can go out and get a, uh, a taxpayer ID if they want. And they can start paying taxes and they can contribute to our, uh, you know, to our tax, uh, tax base. But I, I don't think that, uh, that, that giving them employment is going to uh, alleviate the, the problem of immigration or illegal immigration. It's going to give them an opportunity to come in and get jobs, and, and they're going to want to come more so. Um, I did uh, experience one of the largest raids on a, uh, on a work site uh, about five years ago. We were down in um, Jackson, Mississippi, in the area where uh, chicken plants were raided for illegal aliens. And, uh, and we rounded up hundreds, and it was a huge operation. It was probably actually more work to set it up and get everyone there than actually what came out of it. Because at the end of the day, you're just grabbing a few illegal aliens um, without criminal records and, and you're making their life really, lives really miserable when you can be using those officers to go out and back, grab the bad guys. So, but I don't think to answer your question, I don't think giving them work permission um, and, and rewarding them is the answer. Awesome, listen, thank you so much for doing this. This is fantastic. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome, okay. guys. So, Brian, what'd you think? That's uh, Anthony and I met working in the uh, institutional hearing program. I was a trial attorney, so I was the person who was uh, was uh, taking a lot of the cases that he was arresting people for and putting them in front of the immigration judge. So as, as somebody who hasn't you know, worked in that field, what did you think? I found it very interesting because it seems like on this issue, all we hear from are people who are either politicians or political appointees or high level people 
we rarely hear from people who are on the ground. I mean, we see images of them, we hear what they're doing, but we never really get a voice to go along with that. So to hear from someone who's done that work, who's done the deport work, it was a was a perspective that you rarely hear. Now it's interesting because he he made a point of mentioning that we had a bunch of good guys that we worked with, and that was true. There's a little story on that regard. Uh, I was doing a hearing inside the prison, and they would actually let family members who wanted to come observe the uh, the hearings come in. And uh, we had a uh, a bunch of family members when they realized this was not going well for their incarcerated relative. Uh, actually start to to become threatening and get a little bit violent. And uh, I didn't push a panic button or anything. Somebody working for the court, uh, I don't know if it was the immigration judge or one of the secretaries, hit the button we had for uh, staff to come in. And in the blink of an eye, like four or five of these guys were there. There were two of them standing flanking me. Uh, guys and, and gals, because, you know, we had, uh, uh, you know, I would say about uh, our, our workforce was probably about 40 people. I would say about half the people were immigrants, probably about a quarter were women. So, I mean, it was a really interesting group that just kind of hit on on all of American society. And it, it you know, people were very dedicated to enforcing the law and to taking care of each other and keeping Americans safe. And I mean, it was, I've never experienced anything like this. It was just like somebody hit the button and I blinked. And the next thing you know, I got two people, trained law enforcement officers on either side of me watching my back while I'm making an argument in the court. And there were four or five more of them who were up at the back of the courtroom, just watching everything eagle eyed. It was, it was pretty cool. I found it interesting, his answer, when he said it takes approximately two years from hiring to deployment of some of these officers. You hear these politicians say so cavalierly, oh, we'll, we'll hire more people. If we hire them right now, they're not going to really be useful for the problem in for two years. How much more damage is going to be done in two more years at this pace? Yeah, it, it's that's a good question. I mean, it's... Immigration law, as you well know, is complex. It's not the easiest thing to learn. The CBP inspectors, the deport officers, the uh, ICE special agents, the Border Patrol agents, and the pilots slash agents who work for ICE, Air, and Marine, their training ranges anywhere from like 26 to 36 weeks. And that's just the initial training. For trial attorneys, because they're talking about trial attorneys and judges, trial attorneys need to go to four years of college, three years of law school, pass a bar, and then meet the minimum experience requirement for whatever pay grade the government is hiring at. Immigration judges have to have a minimum of seven years practicing immigration law specifically in, in order to get hired. Uh, unless they fall into some other special categories. They were military judges in the JAG Corps, things of that nature. So, yeah, this is, is not something that, you know, we can snap our fingers and, and have this, you know, immediately turn around. I think the other thing that's important is you heard Anthony. He's a very bright, very articulate guy. College educated, he said he started working right after he graduated college where he studied business and marketing. The media has a tendency to portray everybody that works for immigration as some kind of a xenophobic, racist troglodyte. And, and that's clearly not the case. I mean, here you had a guy who was just a patriotic American and he repeatedly said he just wanted to do his job to protect the American public. And my experience of the workforce was, was just what he said. It was a lot of great people who sincerely wanted to, to protect the United States. A lot of veterans who did that after they got out of the military. You know, so it, it's number one, this whole deportation force that sounds menacing like a bunch of jackbooted government thugs is far from the truth. And then the other thing is to spin that up and expand it. You're right. It's it's two years before you can get boots on the ground. And then in a lot of cases, before you can get people allocated to where they need to be and fully field trained, it's even more time. It was also good to hear him debunk some of the arguments for sanctuary policies, namely that uh, it would allow more compliance with local police. And he seemed to Throw water on that. He did. Uh, and and interestingly enough, he said the same thing that when Spencer Raley and I, when I was the research director at FAIR, we, we researched this. 
And, you know, we found that, number one, there wasn't any measurable difference in cooperation between sanctuary jurisdictions, non-sanctuary jurisdictions. But number two, law enforcement people, state and local law enforcement people, as well as federal people, repeatedly told us, these people come from places and cultures where people don't cooperate with the police. End of story. And, you know, that's even true in places that aren't necessarily developing countries. Like, generally speaking... I think is a, an artifact of World War II. The Germans don't really, you know, they don't have this fascination with the police that we do here in the United States. Uh, I think some of the Asian countries, you know, the police are considered a necessary evil, but they're they're not lionized in television programs and movies the way that they are here in the United States. So it's, uh, you know, it didn't surprise me at all that he said that because my experience working in that kind of stuff and my experience researching it is these folks, they don't care, like he said, if it's the INS or the meter maid. Anybody with a badge, a uniform, and authority, they distrust and they don't want to talk to. Well, Matt, New York City's had a robust sanctuary policy for a long time now. It's not like they're a wash and crit. Oh, never mind. Well, you know what? And here's the thing that the public wouldn't know. When I was a trial attorney with ICE, I would get five, and I think I've told you this before, I would get five or six calls a week from the district attorney's offices with these people saying, I got a guy from the Dominican Republic and, and you know dot, dot, dot. When it first happened, I waited and I thought they were going to say, you know, this guy's a drug dealer, serial killer, murderer, rapist. I want you to help me get rid of him. No, inevitably it was. And he was the victim of a crime, but he doesn't want to testify. What can you do for me? And finally, I, I had to have a discussion with one of the DAs. And I said, listen, there's letter inners and kicker outers. I'm not a letter inner. I'm a kicker outer. <laughs> My job is not to find people who broke the law and then are involved in suspect behavior a way to stay in the United States, I remove people who have broken the laws. There's nothing I can do for you. And five or six times a week, even after we had that conversation, they'd still call and ask. And the, the, you know, the reality is even people who are lawfully here, a lot of people who have immigration status are afraid that if they become embroiled in anything that involves the police, they're going to wind up losing their immigration status because their, their concepts of law, justice, and due process are just drastically different from what we're used to here in the United States. Anyone who was around New York City in the 90s when Giuliani was the mayor, if you took the city as it was then, clean, clean streets, low crime, biggest, uh, safest big city in the country, and fast forward to now, and you mean to tell me there's no difference between that New York and this New York? If if you think that, you've been so drunk on ideological Kool-Aid that you just can't see anything. I lived in New York for a couple of years uh, from like, uh, you know, 98 to, to 2000, around there. And, uh, you know, I, I lived actually just across the river uh, in Jersey City, New Jersey. And Jersey City, New Jersey is, is not reputable as a safe, wonderful place to live, but it, it was what I could afford at the time. And I, you know, I lived in a fairly nice neighborhood of Brownstones, but, you know, I would regularly take the PATH train, uh, which is the Port Authority Trans-Hudson Tube. It's a, a Jersey to New York subway over to, uh, you know, 34th Street Station on the subway in New York and then take the subway uh, to to meet my friends on the evenings. And I come back at two or three o'clock in the morning. Subway in New York runs, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy hours. But, you know, I come back ridiculously late and maybe I was just being stupid, but there were so many police officers on the street, on the trains. I never felt unsafe. As a matter of fact, the stretch that I felt least safe on was, was walking from the path station uh, to my apartment because, you know, occasionally you'd see a Jersey City police officer or a Port Authority police officer there, but it wasn't guaranteed. But anytime that I was in Times Square, uh, you know, if I was uh, anywhere in the central part of New York, like five minutes wouldn't go by without you seeing a police officer. So it, it was very different from what I hear now. Five minutes can't go by without you witnessing a crime. So to wrap up, the deport officers are not jackbooted thugs. They're real people. It takes a long time to train them to do what they need to do. Yeah, they're skilled professionals. Yes. And we needed more years ago, but we haven't even started training them yet. And and key point, September 11th was an immigration thing. Yes. So 
who knows? Anthony said this. We don't know who's coming in at the southern border. Who knows how many people with evil intentions like the September 11th attackers or worse intentions are coming through now? We don't know. Thanks for tuning in to the No Border, No Country podcast. You can find us all over the web, uh, particularly at Spotify, on X, and on YouTube. Please tune in, stab the like button, stab the subscribe button. And if you'd like to get more information on early and what we do, you can take a look at www.early.org, our website. And there's a place there to make a donation if you'd like to support the work that early does. 